Explicity Cast from Explicity. On the 18th of June, 1895, Winston Churchill, a junior officer in the Force of Zars, sailed for Europe from Bombay, Mumbai. He cut an elegant figure in his cavalry uniform. He was good looking, his eyes blue, his hair ginger, his countenance distinctly boyish. Very different from the statue by Ivor Robert Jones, which now stands in Parliament Square, London. This huge bronze image of Churchill, wearing a military great coat, one hand resting on a stick, his legs apart and his shoulders thrust forward, rests on a plinth standing 20 feet tall, over six metres. The effect is to convey a sense of solidity and permanence. In 2012, this iconic statue was sprayed with red paint to look as if red blood were emerging from Churchill's mouth, and a strip of grass like a Mohican haircut was placed on its head. Ten years later, in the course of Black Lives Matter protests, when Churchill was repeatedly being accused of responsibility for the famine in Bengal of 1940-42, the statue was attacked again. Underneath the name Winston Churchill, the words, is a racist, were daubed. The statue of the man, so often described as the saviour of his country, had to be crated up for its own protection. In 1945, Winston Churchill was the most famous man in the world. His fellow countrymen revered him. He had brought them to victory. He was seen as single-handedly having saved his nation from annihilation. He was applauded not only by his own country, but the free world recognized that it remained free and the values which it shared continues to exist only because of his leadership in the early years of the war. He was far from being a little Englander, he was a patriotic Briton, but his true commitment was to the world. He had an incredibly wide sympathy for ordinary people, wherever they might be. The scale of his humanity was demonstrated by the way he stretched out to succor his former enemies, he did so after the South African War, did so after the First World War. Had he been in office, he would have done so again after the Second World. And yet, in 1921, at the Cambridge College named after Churchill, that constitutes the National and Commonwealth Memorial to him, there was a year-long series of discussions entitled Churchill, Race and Empire. The theme wasn't whether Churchill had been a racist or not, that was pretty much taken for granted. The conclusion was that the British Empire was a blueprint for Nazism, that the Holocaust was not an outlier at all, that Churchill's views on race were much the same as the Nazis, and that Churchill facilitated the Bengal famine of 1943. Why has his image so changed? Was the hero of 1940 to 45, the savior of his nation, a racist enemy of India? That is what this book is about. Some people just seem to have that star quality. Winston Churchill, he was one of those. No matter how many books and documentaries you may have imbibed, or speaking of imbibed, how many tales you may have heard of his brandy infused mornings, because who needs coffee, right? There's always an insatiable appetite for more and more Churchill. His wit, his wisdom, and yes, even his lack of filter in his shock jock pronouncements all added up to a mystique, frequently a respect even, that even the former colonies do not deny. Maybe this respect comes because of his sense of personal conviction and his uncompromising dedication as a patriot and not the least because he is credited with defeating Adolf Hitler. Churchill's desire not to let India go seemingly bordered on an obsession. Even when he wasn't steering the ship in India, he always had an eye on the country that made the empire, well, the empire. Today, to guide me through understanding Churchill and India, I have the privilege of talking to my guest, renowned historian and author Walter Reed, whose new book, Fighting Retreat, unravels the layers of Churchill's impact on the Indian subcontinent. As I step into the pages, 
of Reed's insightful exploration, I will discuss key moments, controversies, and nuances that define Churchill's stance on India. But importantly, what really was this enigma? From Churchill's privileged, though unconventional, background, through the many accusations against him for being a racist and for being cold-hearted, there's also this apparent compassion for the underdog. As an example, his support for the Dalit cause, which appeared sincere, as suggested by his discussions over lunch with industrialist and great supporter of Mahatma Gandhi, Ganshamdas Das Birla. In 1917, the Montague Declaration marked the turning point in British ownership of India. The Urban Declaration that followed in 1929 tried to paper over its deficiencies and then, as one thing led to another in the 30 eventful years between 1917 and 1947, that's between Montague and independence, Churchill stoutly opposed any countenance of an India independent of the empire. He spoke of the three factions, Hindus, princely states and Muslims, being the metaphorical three-legged stool upon which Britain could sit indefinitely. Was this divide and rule, or was this merely good administrative tactics? How did it all pan out? I cannot wait to ask Walter Reed about this intricate relationship between the icon, Winston Churchill, and the complex tapestry that's India. And so, to that end, here he is, joining me from his home in Scotland, Walter Reed, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you so much, Ramji. I'm delighted to have been invited aboard. Thank you. To plunge straight ahead, I got sucked into your book on page 50, where, where you describe the dinner that uh, Churchill had with Neville Chamberlain, where he attacked Chamberlain for ignoring India. Now, does that define Churchill's stance towards India? Churchill's stance on India was a developing a developing move. But the interesting thing about Churchill, and one of the reasons I write the book, is that Churchill, in relation to Britain's empire, Britain's colonies, was a liberal. Mm -hmm. He had been an undersecretary of state for the colonies right at the start of his career, at the end of the 19th century, and he was actually secretary of state for the colonies after the First World War. He had also been quite uh, influential at the time of the Boer War. In all these times, he was well disposed to what was then called the subject nations. He thought the British Empire was a necessary uh, entity and a, and a benevolent one because of the, his views on what he would have called civilization and things like that. But he wanted to advance the interests of the subject races as far as possible. When he became uh, Secretary of State for the Colonies after the First World War, Britain found herself in possession of great chunks of the Middle East. After the First World War, the Ottoman, the Turkish possessions in the Middle East had been handed to Britain as what were called mandates. Churchill, far from, as you might have expected with the imperialist image that he has, far from grabbing them and welcoming them as additions to the, 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 the great British Empire that covered a quarter of the globe, he couldn't wait to get rid of them. Why? He thought that uh, Britain had quite enough in her hands. Mm -hmm. He was aware of the expense of maintaining possessions, and he propelled these these countries, particularly Iraq, Jordan, into independence at a very early stage. And yet India was different, and it was in that context that he was coming up against Chamberlain. We're now coming into the 1920s, 30s. By then, he's quite an old man. We, he lived so long that we forget, but even then he was well into his 50s. He was beginning to adopt a more rigid reactionary stance. He'd seen the great empires disappear in the, in the First World War, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He saw communism, Bolshevism coming on. He was animated by ideas of social Darwinism. That nations either fought, shed blood, or they dwindled away. And that was part of the position. Chamberlain, I've written about Chamberlain, and I have a great respect for Chamberlain, but um, Chamberlain was, in this respect, much more liberal than Churchill had now become. So Churchill, by the 1930s, by the time of that dinner with, with Chamberlain, saw the retention of India as absolutely essential. Walter, I plan to quote liberally from your book. Please do, please do. <laughs> Early in the book, you make mention of how Churchill believed that India could not rule itself. 
Now, in a letter which Churchill writes to his old squeeze, Pamela Plowden, who, by the way, is still the subject of much gossip in Bangalore because they lived here together then, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me quote from the letter. Our true duty in India lies to those 300 millions whose lives and means of existence would be squandered if entrusted to those chatterboxes who are supposed to speak for India today. He meant this, didn't he? Yeah, he, well, was he? He made great play of the plight of the Dalits. For uh, military and global reasons, it became necessary to address India's aspirations. He made great play of the fact that we couldn't surrender one element of the Indian population to the whims of the of a preponderant element. The Dalits, he was always talking about them. If you're of a cynical disposition, you'd say this is an extension of the, the, the three-legged stool. Actually, from my reading, I think he genuinely was concerned about the Dalits. He, he was a, I mean, he's a very complex character. I know in India, he's uh, regarded as a demon by many people. Uh, and his behavior towards India was, I argue in the book, was disgraceful, appalling. But he had redeeming features too. Uh, he was very concerned, strangely enough, for someone from his aristocratic background, he was very concerned about the mass of humanity. Uh, how so? Do you have an example? During the Second World War, He'd seen London and the other English cities devastated by German bombing. Um, he, and he then at length, Britain and America started bombing Germany in a, a, a dreadful way. Um, and Churchill went into the private cinema uh, at his country house one evening and they watched the British bombers going and flattening these German cities. And you might have expected it would only have been human, really. If he had come out saying, great, the tide has turned, where I do my Churchill impersonation, where they are last, the boot is on the other foot, he might have said. But, uh, <laughs> he came Very out, good. alas, with tears streaming down his face, and he said, have we become such beasts? Have we become such beasts? Um, and I, I think, actually, he felt for the Dalits in a similar way. I don't, I, I don't think... Um, that was just a cynical political ruse. But uh, he, he, he kept turning to it. He mentioned it. No one else in Britain was terribly interested in the Dalits. He was. You liken Churchill being held down to uh, Gulliver being held down. This quote, One is tempted to see the man of destiny being roped down by puny Lilliputians. Why, why this analogy? And why do you believe it might be misleading when viewed through the lens of World War II? without, of course, the benefit of watching him cry after watching a newsreel. <laughs> um, well, he he was a, I mean, he was a great man. He was, uh, to a large extent, frustrated by people who weren't his equals in any sense. Um, my first book about Churchill was called Churchill Under Friendly Fire. And in it, I'm dealing with the obstacles he faced in getting his policies adopted uh, during the Second World War, his, his strategy, he had to deal with the Americans, who could be very difficult. He had to deal with his wife, who could be very difficult. Um, he um, had the French and he had the British generals, who uh, were very suspicious of him. And he had the political parties. He was not, he didn't command a huge personal uh, following for most of his time during the war, only only towards the end of the war. So he, you can see him as frustrated by uh, people who are getting in his way. I don't say that of India, though. I think um, I, during the war and indeed during the, the years of the legislation in the 1930s that paved the way for the Government of India Act, he was the mischievous one who was doing irresponsible things uh, and uh, 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 he could perhaps have done a little bit more time down at that stage. Hmm. <laughs> I'd like to bring you now to the period between 1917 and 1947, which you covered in your earlier book, Keeping the Jewel in the Crown. Now, I refer specifically to the Montague-Chemsford Declaration, or uh, Montford, if you like, that 
was somewhat positive and leaning towards uh, recognizing independence for India, followed very closely by the Rollout Act, which was draconian. So from a British perspective, weren't these two in conflict? And from a policy perspective, were they just simply carried out independent of each other? I think they were independent, although they they were both reactions, I suppose, to the First World War when India made such a huge contribution to the British war effort, something which isn't recognized in, in Britain. I've, uh, when I've, in India, I notice you uh, Indians tend to be very much aware of what India did in the First World War and in the Second World War. Um, it was a moving picture. I mean, I, I started that book, as I started most of my books, to try to learn something myself because I hadn't really appreciated just how negative British policy had been to India throughout. Um, and the policy from 1917 onwards anyway was to give the impression that uh, great liberal moves were in the offing. But it, there was a silent collusion in the fact that the offing was a long way away. Uh, and words that were used about independence, dominion status, representative government, and so on, meant an awful lot less uh, to those who uttered them than to those who heard them. And I, I find the whole process of that 30 years a shameful um, period of, of um, not direct lies, but of, of, of misleading. And as I wrote it, um, of course, Churchill is important. First of all, as I have said, he's very important in relation to the legislation that was intended to create a federal government for India in 1935. He opposed that. It's a, it's a, a sad conclusion for me. I mean, I, I in an earlier book about Churchill, I said his faults were only the product of an abundance of vigour and enthusiasm. The scale and range of his abilities was matched by a profound sense of humanity and magnanimity. His nobility was the reflection of the belief that mankind was itself noble, endowed with a duty and a destiny. And overall, I adhere to that. I mean, it may, be, it may not be a popular thing to say to an Indian audience, but overall, I think that is broadly true. What is so disappointing is that he behaved so disgracefully towards India. Um, and I, I try in the book to explain why he does that and why he did it peculiarly in relation to India, not in relation to the Middle Eastern colonies that I've talked about or African colonies. I'd like to cycle back to this question about why India, in which case. But first, I want to press home a little bit about his attitude towards the uh, to the Dalits. Now, mostly in India, Winston Churchill would be considered as a as an unlikely champion of the Dalit cause. And from a cynical perspective, it seems rather far-fetched. But nothing that I have read in two of your books seems to suggest that it's anything but true. I think he was honest in relation to the, to the Dalits. He was a profoundly humane person in the abstract. I get that. So, for instance, I mean, he... During the First World War, he'd, he'd fought on the Western Front himself. Right. He'd seen countless friends, family killed in the First World War. Mm -hmm. He'd seen the evidence of German militarism. But the first thing he did when peace was established was to say that he wanted to send out a fat grain ship to Hamburg. Germany was starving as a result of the Allied blockade. So there was a distinction. I mean, he would fight the Germans when they were fighting. He would fight them to the last man. And he would have no hesitation in dropping bombs in the Second World War. But when it came to the generality of a people. And briefly to the question of why India, when he was willing to let go of other parts of the empire? He felt for wrong reasons that, it was in Britain's interest, possibly in India's interest too, to remain part of the British Empire. And how did he address it? So he would politically manoeuvre the separation of the three elements, right. the, yeah. the princes and the... Yeah. Sure. But at the same time, he could feel something profoundly endearing uh, 
in, in this concern for the, the ordinary people. And he always felt that the real India wasn't the political India. In particular, I think he thought that the Congress Party represented a commercial element in India wasn't the same thing. He, he, was, he was aware that a lot of India was rural, very poor country people, and he didn't believe, I think, that either the Congress or the uh, Muslim League truly represented these people. And in his personal life, in his accounts of his time in India, he didn't seem to care so much about having a lot of money. He was quite the big spender, wasn't he, borrowing he, he and so He was in on. India for about 18 months as a young cavalry officer. And he had lived beyond his means in India, as he lived beyond his means everywhere else in the world. He never had the money that he needed for his elaborate lifestyle. So he borrowed from Hindu moneylenders. I wonder how far he was influenced in later life by his own uh, slightly um, embarrassing relationship with the mercantile classes, which he didn't really like. <laughs> <laughs> in, in his book, The Early Days, he calls them agreeable, fat. <laughs> <laughs> And and he said that they were very reasonable. Now, his idea of reasonable was 2 to 3% interest per month. (laughs) (laughs) Only a man of great cash flow would call that reasonable. He he remained in hot to money lenders for most of his life. He um, he may not have found the, the bankers in London that he relied upon as agreeable as the money lenders he met in Bangalore. But <laughs> well, he skipped town without paying his club bill, <laughs> and to this day, <laughs> to this day, the Bangalore club that's called the United Services Club back then is very proud to have the minutes of a meeting set in a glass case that says that that they deem thirteen rupees as irrecoverable <laughs> from. Le- I did that <laughs> lovely. So we, it's, it's what a proud. founder, yeah. <laughs> Everyone here is very proud of it, and we keep quoting it. Anyway, I'd like to move on now to your chapter on the Bengal famine. Yeah, yeah. Now, we know that Churchill has been vilified for, for that, but I have a rather simple question. How could one guy have been the cause or the cure of a famine, especially when there are so many other factors involved? Uh Amataya Sen did exonerate Churchill personally from this and spoke of what else could have happened. The cyclone of 1842, yeah. the Japanese occupation of Burma, which cut off all the rice supplies. My question is this, yeah. how did Churchill become the donkey on which this could be pinned? Well, we all know about Churchill. Not everyone knows about Lord Leathers. Lord Leathers was the minister who was responsible for shipping and logistics during the war. And uh, I, if you have to choose one person for what really isn't blamable on one person, but if you have to choose one person, it would be Leathers, because he was the man who ultimately made the decisions. Uh, He had to balance the military needs of the different parts of the different parts of the world in which Britain was fighting. But, you know, who knows about Lord Leathers? Everyone knows Winston Churchill was Prime Minister. People tend to imagine that he ran the war single-handedly, and he rather behaved as if he did, but he but he didn't in reality. He had to uh, knuckle under to other people. There are other people he could blame. Churchill turned to Roosevelt during the famine. Roosevelt always criticising Britain because we were imperialists and had this empire. Uh, so Churchill turned to the champion of the Indians, if you, said, if you like, and said, can you send them some food? And Roosevelt said, I'm full of sympathy. I'd love to, but we just can't manage it because of the other demands during the war. Churchill was not the most hostile by any manner of means to helping India, Bengal, during the famine. He turned not only to Roosevelt, but to Australia. He managed to get quite a lot of grain from Australia and from Canada, who was also very generous. There were others in the cabinet, who, like Beaverbrook, who were taking a tough line. The, the line being that we must look at how to win the war, ultimately. That said, he didn't filter what he said very well, did he? 
Churchill uh, gave a lot of hostages to fortune by the sort of things he said. He could say some appalling things, sometimes in frustration, sometimes just because that was the age group from which he came. He made very racist remarks. Did, did they mean anything? Well, I, I honestly don't think I'll persuade people of my daughter's age to believe it didn't amount to much. But I argue that his words and his actions have got to be separated. Of all the charges that can be laid against Churchill in relation to his conduct regarding India, I think Bengal is about the least substantial one. As an interesting aside, there's that story of the ship that blew up in uh, the Bombay docks in 1944, the one carrying ammo. What's interesting from a historical perspective is that that explosion caused a delay in famine uh, relief supplies reaching the victims of the famine in Bengal. Uh, most of us know these two incidents separately, but yeah. it's interesting how this uh, one has the consequence on the other. Good point. I don't know if I was saying, really. I think that's a very good point, though. Um, the Bengal famine is one of those things in history where there is a view that's more or less accepted amongst historians and people who have done some serious reading. Uh, I, for instance, I wrote a book about Field Marshal Haig, who was the commander-in-chief of the British forces in France during the First World War. And he, as a result of largely of books and plays and films that were made in the 1960s, he's widely regarded as a, a fool, a, a, a donkey leading the lions, the lions being the soldiers, that Actually, almost everyone who writes or investigates or knows about him recognizes that he was actually quite an advanced, forward-thinking um, military man. But I don't think we'll ever overturn the view of him uh, that's established as a kind of caricature. And I think the Bengal famine may be something similar that um, people, you're, you're nodding, Randy, and people uh, who have investigated the thing take one view. But the other view is so pervasive that I, I wonder if it will ever be displaced. In in your book, Keeping the Jewel in the Crown, I'm paraphrasing, you said that Gandhi agreed that the Brits were just doing their job. And I quote, Gandhi was entirely comfortable with the English and claimed to be like them. He said that if he had been English, he would have done exactly what the English were doing <laughs> in India. In a way, that sort of demonstrates the greatness of Gandhi, doesn't it? That he can see two sides. He came to the Inns of Court in London. He dressed uh, in formal court wear. He, he took dancing lessons. I rather love that. <laughs> Bruce Lee gave dancing <laughs> lessons. <laughs> That's bad. No, I didn't. <laughs> really, a, really a ballroom dancer, really. I, I, well, the idea of Bruce Lee and Mahatma Gandhi dancing. I, I'm, going, I'm never going to be able to forget that. Thank you for that. Didn't do much for the British Empire, all this dancing. Uh, well, beautiful couple. <laughs> <laughs> and now coming to my final couple of questions. This is about Churchill's legacy and morality. Now you discuss whether Churchill was evil or he was not. And I quote, Churchill and his family were not personally implicated in the evils of imperialism. My point is simply that this period of history was in his DNA, in the ballast of his settled assumption. Ballast of his settled assumption. Very nice phrase, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So, was he evil or wasn't he? No, he wasn't. Actually, I was really dealing at that point in the book with the imperial legacy of slavery, um, the West Indies and so on. And Churchill wasn't directly involved in that. The great Duke of Marlborough, who was Churchill's great hero, who had fought in the early 18th century, his, his wife, Sarah, I think, had some interest in estates in the West Indies. Churchill, um, unlike so many people, as we're now discovering, there's a great deal of detective work going on to find out just who had interest in slavery and who didn't. I don't think the Churchill family really did have, and that was, that was, I think, what I was exonerating him from there. He wasn't involved in that. I have different views about different aspects of Churchill's career and history, but um, I don't think in any respect you could call him an evil man. 
No. You, you've answered the question about the struggle that people have, and they might have while reading your book as well, by slipping into a binary view of Churchill, you know, racist or not, India hater, India beta, champion of the underdog or not, and so on and so forth. And it's uh, sufficient to say that he was a well-nuanced individual, which brings me to my final question. You know, there's no denying that some people have a star quality called an X factor. And Churchill certainly had that in spades, didn't he? Did, you know, my city, Bangalore, has an obsession with this guy. No story of ba old Bangalore can be told without provoking his ghost. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 according to you, is his, uh, is the secret sauce? I think what was special about Churchill was the spark of humanity he was he was really interested in people uh, he he was an aristocrat he came from a very aristocratic background but he he chose to mix with people who didn't come from that background most of his friends didn't come from that background his wife deprecated the choice of friends because uh, some of them were quite disreputable um he had the he had the interests and appetites of a fairly ordinary man and i think that's why he appealed in britain you know without going further afield than britain he uh the working man in the pub could identify with old winnie and old winnie couldn't have come from a more different background but they understood what he what made him tick he understood what made them tick when he went into the east end of london during the war and the place was bombed um, he turned up the first after the first really heavy bombing, and the crowd saw him, and they said, "We knew you would come. We knew you would come." They knew he just couldn't stay away from from his fellow countrymen in their suffering. The tears were pouring down his cheeks as he stalked through the rubbish. Another occasion, he was leaving London by train, as and he heard the sirens going. The bombs were going to come over that night, and he something you and I perhaps couldn't do. He got the driver to turn the train around <laughs> and went back to London because he just couldn't face the idea of not sharing the dangers and the privations of ordinary people. He desperately didn't want to see a third world war. And his, his declining years were devoted rather sadly because he, he was declining in every sort of way and he was being ignored by... American presidents and by Stalin and Russia, but his concern there was to avoid another war, to see the world sinking into yet another war. Now, that wasn't for his own benefit. He was a very old man by then. It was the fate of the world that concerned him. And I think that, I think people recognized that. He, you know, when he went into crowds, he engendered respect. No one, they rarely booed, they rarely ignored, ignored him. People could see that he was a humane man. And I think, you know, I hope people, people read my book out, they will think about it and just conceive it possible that he wasn't the villain that he sometimes looked to be. And that is such an interesting perspective. Very few people in the world can command this kind of public devotion. And on that note, Walter Reed, this was such fun. Thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Well, Ramji, thank you for inviting me in. It's been great fun. I've really enjoyed our chat. I wish we could carry on for another hour or two. <laughs> You've been listening to Walter Reed, historian and author of the book Fighting Retreat, Churchill and India. There's a link in the podcast description to where you can get yourself a copy of his book. And I'll be back with our fun etymology section. What's that word? Where we look in words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about. Right after this. And I'm back. This is What's That Word? And this is my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati. But you can call me P. It's P with an A, not another E. And hello to you, P with an A. How are you doing this fine morning? I'm excited. Why? End of season three. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've done 71 episodes to date. 
every single one of them so enjoyable 71 episodes in two years truly mm, and you have to read books for every episode we do if that um, yes well often more than one i know you keep track how many books have you read in these two years many i don't really um oh, of course you do really you keep a list i've seen it okay tell me how many books of walter reed have you read hey but Great conversation, by the way. Two books, and thank you. Two. Okay, so then shall I say you've read about 100 books in these two years? Mm, close enough. About 145. <laughs> close? How is 145 books close to 100 books? I mean, what sort of math is this? Quantum. <laughs> what? That's not even a thing. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Okay, P with an A. What's that word? Hey, can we talk about Churchill today? Sure. What do you want to know? So, in your monologue, you spoke of Churchill's wit. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't hear much of it these days, do we? No. But I have heard that he had a clever and wicked wit. Yes, he had a mischievous wit. I, I can't exactly call it uh, humor, like like jokes or something in a stand-up comedy sense. You know, there mm. were no body or, or ribald jokes either. That that wasn't his jam. But boy, did he <laughs> relish the artistry of a very cleverly placed, well-timed retort. It's like he kept this, this linguistic toolkit, you see, and mm. he was <laughs> always ready to pull out the perfect verbal lance for the joust, if you like. <laughs> speaking Forever. of which, speaking of which, in his eulogy, JFK said something to the effect that Churchill had weaponized the English language and sent it to war. <laughs> wow, I love that. And I heard that he had the wittiest insults too. Uh, is that true? <laughs> yes, it is. Some of them were downright cutting. <laughs> Sounds delightful. Okay, let's hear some. Uh, I'll start with one that I have heard but forgotten. You mm -hmm. know, where he insults a woman who calls him a drunk. <laughs> yes. Oh, that one. Okay, right. Okay, Bessie Braddock, the member of parliament, once said to him, Winston, you are drunk. And what's more, you are disgustingly drunk. And Churchill, who was then the prime minister, responded like this. My dear, you are ugly, and what's more, you are disgustingly ugly. But tomorrow morning, I shall be sober, and you will still be disgustingly ugly. <laughs> oh, no. Did that really happen? Who can be sure? But there's this guy who's supposed to be a Churchill quote, quotation expert, named Richard Langworth. He claims that one of Churchill's bodyguards confirmed that this <laughs> exchange had taken place. Okay, another one, please. Okay, this one's a little more colorful. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, he delivered this insult when he was sitting on the potty when he got a call from the Lord Privy Seal. And so he sent him a message that went like this. Tell him I can only deal with one shit at a time. <laughs> Okay, you can't stop now. Keep going. All right. And then he sort of cut down Prime Minister Clement Attlee by calling him a sheep in sheep's clothing. Poor guy. There are many, but I'll tell you one more. Uh, this is a known one again. There's this exchange with Lady Astor, who was so fed up with him that she said, Winston, if I were your wife, I'd put poison in your coffee. And Churchill replied, Nancy, mm -hmm. if I were your husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> So did these reports simply just come to him? <laughs> some of them, I'm sure. But I did read that Langworth once said that some of these were carefully rehearsed. Carefully rehearsed, unlike what we do here. <laughs> totally unlike us. We're extempore. Say, does extempore have a side effect of making our noses grow longer? Um, truthfully? <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Tell me also, I heard that um, Churchill made up new words like Shakespeare did. Is that true? Not really. I don't think so. But I do know that he made the word quizzling popular through a speech, but that's hard to pin down, but I can believe it. What's quizzling? A traitor? 
like uh, we mm -hmm. might say Mir Jafar in India. Exactly. It was named for the Norwegian, this guy Quisling, who offered to help the Nazis take over his country, Norway. And did they? Yes. They occupied Norway after, anyway, after one failed attempt at a coup. Uh, and a couple of years later, Quisling became the head of a puppet government that the Nazis had set up. And then he committed all sorts of atrocities alongside the Nazis, apparently. Ah, what coup? Okay. So when Germany invaded Norway in 1940, Quisling, on the day of the invasion, decided that he could stage a coup and become the leader of the government. But the coup failed and he was arrested. Was that not risky business, sucking up to one's enemy? <laughs> yes, it was. And by the way, Churchill had something to say about that too. Really? What was it? He had this description of an appeaser that fit a quizzling well. He said, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile hoping it will eat him last. <laughs> That's so clever. <laughs> hey, and there, folks... We squeezed in a what's that word? Quizzling. <laughs> yes, we did, didn't we? <laughs> did Churchill write a lot when he was stationed here in Bangalore? Write? Um, in those years, I don't know, not much. I don't, nothing much there. But, but he did spend a lot of his time reading. He read a lot. You see, he writes in his, in his memoirs that he feared that he was undereducated when compared to his cohort. Um, so he took advantage of his rather boring life in the cantonment, and every day after morning parade, he would find the time to read copiously. But as, as for writing, he did write one amazing essay in 1897, sitting in his house on Trinity Church Road in Bangalore, I'm sure. It's called The Scaffolding of Rhetoric, and it's about the importance of using language. In his case, he was talking about a speech. And here, I'll read you the opening. Here goes. Of all the talents bestowed upon men, none is so precious as the gift of oratory. He who enjoys it wields a power more durable than that of a great king. He is an independent force in the world. Wow. And do you have a copy of this essay? Yes, of course. I'll send it to you. Ah. And uh, you found this while researching our new podcast? <laughs> ah, you are slyly announcing our new podcast. Okay, well, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, for all our listeners, we will take a break for a few weeks. We're working on our new podcast about the city of Bangalore. More about that and some other exciting announcements all very soon. Yes, that's true. Okay, so P with an A on that note. From me, Here's wishing all our fans and trolls <laughs> happy season and a happy new year. I shall begin my festivities as soon as I'm out of this studio. <laughs> and you will say to 2023. Bye. And that's our show. I'd like to thank my guest, Walter Reed, and my co-host, Pranati P. with an A, Madhav. And this marks the end of Season 3 of The Literary City, and I'd like to thank you all for being here, for listening, and for being so wonderfully supportive. Now, we'll be back in January with a new season, new topics, new books, new guests, new fun. And until we meet again, have a wonderful season, have a wonderful New Year's, and don't drink and drive through any of this. So, have fun, and see you again very soon. 